Hello, Sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This week, we'll be talking, well, week one of MLS and Bielsa and more Kanye and Roman and Tuchel and Chicharita and Vela and Josie and Cincy and Charlotte and uniforms and so much more. But first, joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you on this Monday, February 29th in the year 2022? Doing well, coming off our first MLS weekend of the season. Oh, my goodness. Have you watched anything? Let's uh, let's get that uh, out of the way, because I, I've continued on the Kanye thing. We're episode two of the three here, and it and it has not dropped the ball yet. It's still riveting, as uh, as I said last week. So I am continuing to watch it, and I do recommend it. I am in TV heaven right now. Really? Yeah. I'm not. There's not a whole lot that I'm interested in right now. Uh, we're taping this on a Monday morning. Uh, last night, the final season of Killing Eve premiered, a show I enjoy very much. Uh, tonight, a uh, new season of My Brilliant Friend kicks off on HBO. Um, also another episode of The Gilded Age, which I'm enjoying. And then come March, you have Atlanta coming back, Peaky Blinders. In April, you have Better Call Saul coming back, Ozark. So next couple of months for me will be action packed. I'm in kind of a drought, which means I just go back to the well, right? Uh, the original well, which is old movies. So for example, you know, I watched All the President's Men and Absence of Malice and The Verdict, those types of classic movies that I just, uh, that I just love. And they all hold up. They're all really, really uh, good. Not well, they don't all, all hold up, but a lot of them, uh, a lot of them do. Um, before, we, before we move on, we were talking off air uh, about your your car problems, um, and we didn't mention this on a previous po- previous podcast. And yet, this is this is low hanging fruit for us. All right, did you did your car get towed? This is like two weeks old now. You really want to circle I, back? To I that? want your car got towed. I didn't know that that happened anymore, and especially not for someone like you. So w- what happened? I got a text that said you were having some car difficulties. I think that's what you use. Correct. Uh, this was a day where we were going to have Doug McIntyre on the podcast. Right. Um, and I decided to get in a hike that morning and uh, parked my car on the road in a place that I thought was okay. When I came back, the car was not there. I was freaking out. Uh, I called the police to report a stolen car. And she said, the woman, uh, are you sure it wasn't just towed? I'm like, well, I don't know, maybe. And she said, let me call your local towing place there. And put me in touch with them. And I asked, hey, do you by chance have a such and such? I won't reveal my car on this uh, podcast. <laughs> um, but uh, the guy said, yep, we got it. Picked it up about an hour ago. And I oh, well, can I get back? He said, if you're willing to fork over $300 or whatever it was. Now, what, what, what had you done? Had you just figured that this is a good place to stop my car? I mean, there were no other cars anywhere? Or looking back on it, do you? Very you foolish. See, yeah, okay. th- there was a sign saying that you couldn't park there at that hour. I just missed it. But I mean, let's pay this off. Literally, let's pay this off. What did it cost you? Uh, it was like three hundred dollars. <sighs> Brutal. I got you. Well, I hope you learned a lesson. I did. <laughs> all right, you ready to light this candle? Let's do it. All right, we're going to jump right into it because there's all sorts of stuff, and we're going to actually try to make this <laughs> this pod a, a little shorter than we have been in the past. It's an attempt. Uh, you know, we we've put some. They're not artificial. Some real constraints we have here with the studio, and maybe that will make us become much more. Uh, brief and efficient. They can pry us away from the uh, from the desks. That would make for good radio and or TV. All right, let's uh, start first week of MLS. Uh, they're back, right? Uh, where do you want to start? Carlos Vela? Is this it? Is it is it back? I mean, keep in mind, there was a couple of years ago when I took a lot of crap. I mean, you know, that narrows it down, right? Uh, because I had said that Carlos Vela was one of the top 20 five players in the world. Everybody screamed and yelled. That's at, at the level that he was playing. Now, we come into 2022. And by the way, since then, he has not only not played well, but he also just hasn't played. And a combination of COVID and, and things going on and injury and all that kind of stuff. But he, you know, he announced his presence and his return with authority coming out with a hat trick right off the bat in the first opening weekend. Is Carlos Vela back? Free nothing, by the way. They won against the Colorado Rapids. And Vela gets a hat trick. Yep. He scores all three goals. Uh, keep in mind, his contract is up in the summer. He's oh. negotiating an extension right now. It's amazing how that happens. Yes. And all of a sudden, he's in great shape and looking motivated. 
Uh, but yeah, certainly an encouraging start from him. By the way, my Christian Arango golden boot pick is not looking great because I neglected to consider that uh, five of Arango's 14 goals uh, last season came via the penalty spot. Mm. And if Carlos Vela is fit, presumably he will take He's the penalty. So uh, one of the goals was uh, from the penalty spot. Um, so yeah, very impressive for him. Very impressive for LAFC. Steve Truindolo gets his first win. Um, so yeah, let's hope he stays healthy because MLS is a lot more exciting when Vela is... And, and, and with regards to the contract, by all accounts, even though it has been up and down at different times, uh, at different times, he has at least outwardly looked like he has enjoyed his time in Major League Soccer and LAFC. He's one of I think only two players left from that original team, and he was their marquee signing. And I and I think in totality, he's absolutely worked out. He is a star. We also know that Carlos Vela is an enigma, and uh, and he can probably be difficult and he thinks about what he wants to do in a way maybe that others can't relate to um but i mean i think this ultimately gets done i mean unless he has real desires to go back to mexico because i don't think necessarily anything big is coming up uh, overseas there could be a big money type of uh, thing just for money uh, out there but I, I feel like this should get done right the uh, alternative would be back to where Al Sociedad, I guess uh, his wife is from there, I, I think is the story. So there might be a family consideration there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it seems like his uh, preference would be to stay. So I think a deal will get done. And, you know, just to give people a look behind the curtain uh, in our pregame show on Saturday leading into Portland, New England, we played a, a offside onside, which is the, this game where Rob Stone puts out a statement and you have to say whether you agree with it or not. Originally in the run out, it was going to be Chicharito will win the golden boot this year. And then when Vela scored that hat trick, we changed it to Carlos Vela will win the golden boot. But Chicharito said, not so fast. Not I, so fast. I, I do belong right. in that conversation. So if you want to transition to the other yes. LA team and our other Mexican star. You know, at the risk of being uh, LA centric. I mean, <laughs> listen, two of the biggest uh, players in the league playing for two of the biggest clubs in the league. And I know Atlanta and Seattle are going to scream and yell and, and others out there. But they stepped up. And Chicharito, by the way, if you haven't seen it, go, go check out his wardrobe, his getup. Uh, th this whole phenomenon of um, the, it's basically a, a, a catwalk, if you will, uh, where you arrive at the stadium and there's video and still footage of what the players are wearing as they walk in with the swagger and the strut and all that kind of stuff. It never, it never happened in, in my day. I can't remember what I, what I wore if I wasn't wearing a, a coat and tie. I mean, it never occurred to me that what I was wearing was going to be of any source of interest or amusement. And it probably, relative to what they do now, isn't. But if, if you see what Chicharito wore to the game, you damn well better bring it if you are going to wear what he, what he wore. It is, um, how do I describe this? It's kind of like, um, you know, the, the, like a a bowling shirt and he looks like he even has a bowling bag and it's just incredibly colorful and and wonderfully uh flamboyant and says look at me so if you if you strut in wearing that you better be decisive and make an impact on the game and he was zero zero all the way to the end chicharito gets the one chance um that he needs he actually had a couple of uh chances out there and he buries it where the winner sends all the sold out 27 plus thousand people that were there at the opening game for the galaxy uh home happy so he just when he's on the field and that's that's not always but when he is on the field it's a good thing for the los angeles galaxy and goals tend to come we also saw douglas costa make his uh his david what do you think in general of the uh of the game and chicharito uh, Douglas Costa, I thought a mixed bag. Yeah. Uh, started off pretty lively, but then as the complains a lot, on, doesn't he? Yeah, was uh, got tangled up with Maxi Morales there in the first half. That was a weird moment. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think it was overly encouraging, but a couple things. That no, I mean uh, it's no. I'm willing to. A uh, couple things here. You mentioned uh, that LAFC beat Colorado, and then Chicharito and the Galaxy knocked off NYCFC. Uh, the four teams that played in CCL this past week, 0 for 4 in the opening weekend of MLS. So keep that in mind. It's hard to well, compete on multiple fronts. Is it, or are you, are you really tired? I mean, is it tired or is it just the, the rhythm of playing isn't there? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to make of that. Secondly, this is a World Cup year and 
I think Mexico is going to qualify, but they're going to do so in a fashion that's going to erode a lot of Tata Martino's uh, credibility there and in a way that's exposed perhaps some issues up front. So I'm just wondering about Chicharito and Vela now. Chicharito's chomping at the bit to get back in the mix. Right. With Vela, half the battle is convincing him even to play for Mexico. But, uh, you know, if, if they have monster seasons, uh, you know, I, I think that's at least going to be part of the conversation. I mean, if Mexico had a do-or-die game tomorrow and you could have Chicharito or Rogelio Funes Mori leading the line, who would you prefer if you were Mexican? I, I'll be honest. I have always said I would rather mark Chicharito. I, I know he's, he scores goals, but I, I find him predictable. And that's not necessarily, doesn't mean you can't be affected, even if you're predictable, if you're, if you're clinical. And, and I don't think he, he necessarily is. I, I just, yeah, I, I, but, you know, Funes Mori has kind of come up and come down. I mean, look, we're, we're going <laughs> to... Frankly, I don't view Funes Mori as that unpredictable either. He's... Exactly. That same sort of mode of exactly. striker. So I don't, I don't think they have... I mean, kind of like the U.S., they don't have a lot going up top. It's hoping Raul Jimenez exactly. rediscovers his pre-injury form. Exactly. Where do you want to go to now? Well, I, I brought up our game, Portland, New England, on Saturday. Uh, I might be biased, but I thought this was the best game uh, of the weekend. 2-2, draw back and forth. We already saw an early candidate for goal of the year, Jimmy Chara, with that incredible bicycle kick. What did you make of this one? And, and there was a fire to it. There was, there, there, was, uh, there, there was an emotion. There was a passion. Obviously, games in Portland are, are great in terms of the atmosphere and the environment that is created up there. But I just thought the way it went, it, it went back and forth. And it was, it, it was fun. It was fun to watch. I don't think that the Rebs are going to, even though they let the, you know, let the lead get away, I don't think they're going to be bent out of shape. Uh, you know, this is a, a Rebs team that's obviously coming off a very good year. This is a Rebs team that was missing players, including uh, in goal, Matt Turner. Uh, so they'll get a point at a difficult place to play in that first game. They'll take it and move on. Um, I think Portland is banged up anyway. And so I think both of these teams will be pleased with much of the way that they played and ultimately getting that point. So I don't think anybody won or lost more or less relative to the uh, to the one one score. Uh, Columbus, a team I brought brought up last week that uh, I thought could have a bounce back campaign. They hammer Vancouver for nil. Miguel Berry got a goal. Lucas Elrayan found the back of the net as well. So encouraging start for the crew. Yeah. That was the second most lopsided result of the weekend because <laughs> Austin FC beat Cincinnati 5-0. Uh, what did you make of that result? I, I didn't think that Cincinnati could get worse. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that this was no matter what, you're going to do better. And yet they are amazing in their ability to prove me and others wrong. Yeah, this is... It's a, it's, anytime it's a bad look. But in particular for a Cincinnati that you know, made made changes, and so we we know that Cincinnati has been bad. Are they now even worse as a team? I mean, relative to the score, you would say so, and that's not good when you have a brand new coach and a brand new uh, technical director, uh, GM, whatever you want to call uh, Chris uh, Chris Albright over there. And you know, at this point, Pat Noonan might be their best player. <laughs> and, he's their, and he's their head coach. So yeah, it's not, it, it's, it's not good. And again, you can lose it. it it's going to happen. If you're going to win, you're going to, you're going to lose, but be in the game, be competitive, especially if your team like Cincinnati, which has ha now had an epic <laughs> history of failure. And so, yeah, it's not good. It's not a good way, but Things can, uh, things, can, things can change week to week, but that's a bad message for a team that could ill afford to be sending bad messages. In our FS1 game on Sunday, Atlanta looked very good, I thought. They beat Sporting KC 3-1. Um, Luis Araujo, who I felt like was primed for a monster campaign, he scores the opening goal, goal of the season, too. but then comes off. They're saying it, it could be a potentially serious hamstring injury, could be out a while, so waiting on word on that, but that was sucks. very disappointing. Uh, but Dom Dwyer comes on for him and scores. Then the kid, Caleb Wiley, gets the third. So, so far, so good for Atlanta. Gonzalo Pineda. Huh? Yeah. Uh, and it was, inter it was interesting watching that game. And, and Joseph Martinez, who ended up being provider, we don't necessarily associate him always with. I mean, he's, he's certainly capable of, of hitting some very, very good passes and getting assists. But I, I, I kept watching him in the celebration modes. Uh, modes. And I, I don't, 
I don't think that he that he wasn't happy for others. But this is a goal scorer. This is a guy who feeds off of goals. And when other people are scoring, there certainly is a natural part of him that is irked, shall we say. And and that's a good thing. That's a that ultimately that's a good thing. He just wants to win. But and Dom Dwyer <laughs> coming off the bench didn't even think he was going to you know, play more than 15 or 20 minutes coming off the bench, comes in uh, and does the job. And that's why you go out and you get backups. And in particular, backups who understand the league and have a certain level. You're not expecting them to play every single game. But if there is a problem, as there was very early, early uh, very early on, you have faith that this person is going to to come in. And then on the other side of it, for was he 16 or 17 years old, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Atlanta kid. Well, anyway, a teenager comes in and scores a goal and i mean off a breakaway and it hit off his shin and he you know double touched it ultimately but it 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 went in the goal he got a goal and so that's good and that bodes well for the future and the development part that we've talked so much about uh, is so important to not just Atlanta or any in particular team but to the league in general going forward so that next crop of teenagers is going to come through where we're saying wow that is a great asset that's going to score goals and win games and or appreciate in value and be that next person that's uh, that's sold. So all in all, a very, very good game for Atlanta on the field. Expansion Charlotte fall 3-0 to DC United. I imagine at the final whistle, Miguel and Hel Ramirez turned to one of his assistants and said, I told you so. Told you, right. Uh, and we have their home opener uh, next weekend, which we're very excited about against the Galaxy. More than 70,000 people are going to be there. Um, so the, the, Charlotte FC off and running in MLS. Yeah, I mean, look... Uh, that was one of those those strange games. And by the way, props to uh, the Charlotte faithful who were there. They were loud. They supported their team. And you lost. And yes, there were some VAR decisions. And yes, there were some moments that it could have gone both ways. And I think in this particular instance, I think it is right, even though you lost, and even though you lost by multiple goals, um, I think it's right in this instance to look at what the game actually was and and in that sense to take a little bit of of heart going forward now that only gets you so far and you got la coming in next week as we said in front of seventy five thousand people uh we will we will be there uh just when you thought it, it couldn't get any worse charlotte i'm coming to town and uh it's going to be fun we're going to see what what's going on but th- Yes, there are some kind of moral victories out there when you're a new team like that. It can't go on forget forever forever. And they thought they had their first goal in history, and then VAR brings it back and the handball, not a handball, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I get the reaction right now, but at this point, for an expansion team like this, you just need to get wins. You don't you shouldn't care about how it happens and losing even in a valiant effort. Okay, but that that only lasts for so long. Uh, Shakiri made his debut for Chicago, which was the second most exciting thing that happened to him. Uh, he, he said he did an interview days earlier that was the highlight of his week. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, you can go back and listen to that. We interviewed uh, uh, Jardin Shakiri, and uh, it was interesting. It was interesting to hear the, what he did know about Major League Soccer, what he didn't. Um, and I, I can you could just see that his head is spinning, as it, as, as it would for anybody coming in. But ultimately, they get a point down in... Uh, uh, down in Miami, he's off to the uh, off to the races. Jury's still out as to how impactful he ultim- ultimately is going to be, but undeniably a, a good player. And you know, here's this interesting thing that he's going to have to deal with. So, you know, it was blazing hot down there uh, in Miami. Now he's going to come back to uh, Chicago to open up this weekend, and I mean, it's a good bet that it's going to be a whole lot colder. So he's going to deal with the different temperatures, but he's going to be at home in front of those fans. They get their first look at home again, uh, of uh, Shakiri. Luis Aguilar is fired, by the way. Okay, what happened? Nowhere in this rundown do I see uh, Pato scoring for Orlando City in their 2 0 win over Montreal. He was genuinely happy. It looked like, I mean, obviously, there's a, probably a sense of relief down there, too, uh, for, for, you know, for who he is. And, you know, the days that we have seen Pato score a goal and or celebrate a goal have been pretty limited over the years, right? It's it's easy to forget this, but in the season opener last year, he played well. Remember, Matt Doyle was praising his performance and then he got injured and it didn't seem like it was going to be that serious, but it wrecked the whole rest of his campaign. I was frankly shocked that we signed him, but 
off to a good start again uh, this year, and this time no injuries, so uh, hopefully he can build off this. Knock on wood that he continues on. Uh, what else? Um, lastly, uh, Nashville, I'm going to go ahead and say this. In a Western Conference final preview, uh, they knock off the Seattle Sounders 1-0, Godoy with a late winner. You know, Seattle, I made that PSG comparison kind of tongue-in-cheek last week, but I do think there's something similar at play here. Uh, Rui Diaz didn't play. Ladero came off the bench. They're still kind of trying to figure out all those pieces. It's just so. not fitting yet. Yeah. You know? It's just not fitting. Uh, and my uh, MLS Cup winners, uh, Nashville, uh, you know, sh- Same here. show up uh, right at the uh, the beginning of the season and go right into the lion's jaws, if you will, and get a uh, get a big result. They did it in a typical Nashville fashion. It was not flash. Uh, the game actually started out back and forth and back and forth. Uh, and to your point, uh, Seattle's going to be fine. I-, I think that Schmetzer will find a way to figure out how to fit all of these different pieces in when they are all healthy and get as many of them on the field as possible. And they're going to cause problems for for a lot of people. But, you know, some early warning signs that just because you have great players doesn't mean necessarily that you are a, uh, a great team yet. But it's a long year, year to come. Uh, that was uh, that was fun to see. I think, you know, all in all for the weekend and the opening of Major League Soccer, uh, there was plenty of goals. There was plenty of interests. You mentioned uh, you know, Jimmy Chara's uh, bicycle. There was world-class types of uh, of moments. Uh, I thought the crowds, for the most part, were good. You know, some interesting things uh, in different places. But um, you know, this is a long-term type of um, uh, of season, and teams will go up, teams will go down. But in general, a pretty solid kickoff to the uh, 27th season in MLS history. Anything else you want to hit on? Uh, no, let's transition okay. to CCL. You got it. Uh, the quarterfinals are set. We have four MLS teams left. We lost one in the round of 16, Colorado, uh, which, by the way, this is the, when we talk about weather and question where the U.S. should schedule its qualifiers, this is the cautionary tale for it because Colorado, they had lost the first leg to Comunicaciones 1-0. They come back home. Comunicaciones get a red card early in the game, and then Colorado score in the first half. Uh, Max Alves, a young Brazilian they bought from Flamengo. Um, so at that point, had that game been played in quote-unquote proper weather, I have no doubt Colorado would have gone through. They're the better team at home with a man advantage. They would have nicked the goal somewhere along the line. You think the weather worked to a disadvantage? It was a Correct. disadvantage to Colorado. It, it started snowing. It got worse as the game wore on. By the second half, it was essentially a blizzard. The field was unplayable. And so, of course, it ended 1-0 and went to penalties. As that game was winding down, I was even wondering, how on earth are they going to take penalties? They needed that snowplow from the John Smith game. That's a very obscure NFL reference. Props to whoever gets that. But uh, they were able to clear the spot, take the penalties. Not surprisingly, lots of players missed because it was just terrible conditions. And ultimately, Comunicación has prevailed Colorado out of the CONCACAF championship. Man. When the Central American teams are able to deal with our weather that we throw at, throw at them now, that's that's problematic going forward. Listen, we mentioned this back, and you know, keep in mind that someone like NYCFC they played their uh, their CCL game in Los Angeles, so you you could have done different things, but this is their home; they have a stadium, and and so I I understand that. The problem is, you know, we mentioned this uh, in the Minnesota game. It's one thing if it's cold. OK, you can you can get through that. And while it may be difficult, especially on the opposition, uh, it, it's cold. The snow completely changes. I mean, we we actually lucked out years ago when we had that qualifying game in uh, in Colorado. We ended up beating Costa Rica because it, to your point, was was unplayable. It, there's no there was no soccer going on. And so then it was a, a war of attrition. And who's going to find a way to lift the ball over the snow and just figure out something in that type of uh, situation? Having said that, it goes to penalties. You got to make your penalties. OK, and that I don't necessarily think had anything to do with the conditions because that's a, you know, a static situation. The ball's there. Kick the ball in the net. And they didn't. Fair enough. Uh, on a positive note, uh, in the only MLS versus League MX matchup in the round of 16, the MLS team prevailed Montreal. Uh, they hammered Santos Laguna 3-0 in the second leg at home to overturn a 1-0 first leg deficit. So they move on. Santos Laguna are in last place in the Clausura in terrible form, and they were missing players. So 
Why do you got to do that? Why do you got to qualify like that? I mean, it's... Well, we have... Uh, so the quarterfinals, like I said, are set, and we have three MLS versus League MX matchups. And as I keep saying, I think this actually sets up relatively well for the MLS teams. Seattle will take on Leon. New England will battle Pumas. Cruz Azul, Montreal. Uh, the one team not facing League MX opposition, NYCFC, will take on Comunicaciones. I expect NYCFC to advance in that tie. I'm going to keep disrespecting Comunicaciones. Um... But looking at the three uh, matchups, here, as I said, we're winning it this year, and not only that, we're winning it before the finals even played. It's going to be an all MLS final. Damn right. Now, Leon, you might recall, have uh, one of my favorite managers, Ariel Ola, uh, very experienced team: Luis Montes, Angel Mena, Jean Menezes, Victor Davila, El Elias Hernandez. Now, so uh, that won't be easy against a Seattle team that, as we just discussed, is still kind of figuring things out. But but I give the Sounders a, definitely a chance there. Uh, New England Pumas to me is at worst a 50-50. I probably even favor New England there. We, we did the Pumas Saprisa second leg. I wasn't overly impressed by that Pumas side. And then Cruz Azul, I would make uh, favorites against Montreal. Although they no longer have Jonathan Rodriguez, who's a player I really like, who went to Saudi Arabia, I believe. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Three MLS versus Liga Mexico. I'm bullish. I am to. bullish of, uh, when it comes to this being the year. And All right, what else? Finally, we talked about the U.S. women's national team uh, last week. They they're, they were taking part in the She Believes Cup. We should uh, put a ribbon on that. In their final game, they beat Iceland 5-0. This is being hailed as a game in which Katarina Macario put it all together and showed that she is indeed going to be the next U.S. superstar. The successor there, I say, to Carly Lloyd. Uh, she scored two fantastic goals and really looked like somebody that, you know, oh, my God, in a couple of years, this could be the best player in the world. Speaking of Carly Lloyd, uh, later on this week, if you are listening to this, you know, in the Tuesday, Wednesday uh, time frame, uh, we will be dropping a very, very special episode of the State of the Union with Carly Lloyd. So please tune into that because it's it's really interesting, uh, the things that she talked about, including the U.S. Women's National Team. Congratulations on uh, She Believes. And. More importantly, I think, and Carly talks about this, is this transition to this new group of players. And, you know, when it comes, you know, to Katarina Macarios and, and those types of players who I thought was really, really good and is going to be interesting. I think she's she's growing with every month, with every game, with every opportunity into something that I think is going to be very interesting for this uh, U.S. women's national team. Uh, so uh, so check that out. I'm going to talk more about the U.S. women's national team uh, um, on the heels of the news uh, that came out this past week in my uh, in my one for the road. So we'll uh, we'll save that for later. Anything else, Moss? That's it. All right. Uh, all right. We're done with that first segment. We're going to take a real quick break. And when we come back, oh, yeah, we're going to take a trip around Europe. Don't go anywhere. All right. We're back. All right, Mossy, let's uh, let's start right in. Uh, where should we go? Uh, Champions League? Well, let's start in England. Okay. But uh, I will uh, weave in Champions League stuff throughout, including right at the top here, because okay. I want to talk about the League Cup final between Chelsea and Liverpool. And we should mention Chelsea were coming off. A 2-0 home win over Lille in the Champions League round of 16, a game in which Christian Pulisic played great, scored a goal, came off to a standing ovation. Um, and so not surprisingly, he got the start against Liverpool. I thought played very well in that game. Um, and Is super he a starter now for Tuchel, you think? I, I think right now, yeah. He did have a, a, a bad miss early in the game, yeah. uh, but but very active. And he also set up. Uh, and in that that left footed chip to Mason Mount on the second half, or Mount hit the post. That was uh, terrific. So let's start with Pulisic. Just overall feelings about his form with another uh, international window right around the corner. As you know, form is fallacy. Okay, <laughs> but all things being equal, equal, yes, I want people playing well. First off, I want them playing, and I want them playing well. And right now, Christian Pulisic is playing well. But I mean, by his own admission, when he comes to the U.S. men's national team, he feels pressure to do and be more. And I hope that that gets sorted out and Greg Berhalter and company nip that in the butt because that could be problematic. Um, but, but all in all, this is, this is good. This is good for his, his long-term success. I still don't think necessarily that he is Tuchel's, Tuchel's cup of tea, but this is a good thing uh, to have happening. I, I knock on wood because we always have to when it comes to Christian Pulisic uh, to stay healthy. It's fun to see from an American perspective. But ultimately, I just want Christian Pulisic to be a factor and to be impactful. He doesn't have to be the best player on the field. He doesn't have to carry the team when it comes to this upcoming window. And if because he is in a good place at Chelsea 
that translates, and it doesn't always, but let's say it does, then great. All, all the better for us. Uh, as for the game itself, one of the most exciting nil-nils I've seen in a long time. It was back and forth, so many chances. There was VAR controversy. I thought Chelsea got the worst of it. I had no issue with that Liverpool goal by Mata being waved off to me, what Van Dijk did. What was the controversy? Uh, two issues. Nabi Keita should have been sent off uh, for that challenge on Chalaba. And then let's talk about the Lukaku disallowed goal. You and I were just in a seminar with Howard Webb. Uh, we, he does this every year to go over VAR at the start of each MLS season. And it was fascinating because uh, Howard Webb showed examples of this very play and said that in MLS, they've determined that that should be a goal. They don't do the lines. They don't want to forensic analyze it. Um, and it, it's, it's funny to have been in that meeting and then days later watch this game and see that Lukaku goal get waved off. So I know, I know you try to have it both ways. When we're talking in the Premier League context, you can't be a little pregnant. And then when it's an MLS, well, the referee's got to read the room and goals are fun, et cetera. So, but you must admit you know, it. When it comes to offside, <laughs> and listen, there's there's difference in, in the number of cameras and so therefore the angles and all that kind of stuff. Look, it, it, if, if one league has decided to use lines and another league hasn't decided to use lines, then those are the then those are the rules, and that's what you that's what you go with. But are you, you know, other than the uh the Keita, you know, kick to the groin there, are are you disagreeing with ultimately the call that was made yes why because would, it was so close i would i would prefer to not use well that, no, that's there. different that that is different we are using lines well, okay, so yeah. because of the line sure i i guess if you're okay, gonna then the, then the right <laughs> call was made all we heard for years we just want to get the call right well now you're getting the call right and yes, different leagues are di using different levels and interpretations when it comes, uh, not, not interpretations, but different levels of technology. And in the EPL, they've decided we have all these cameras, we have all this technology, why don't we use it? So even if it's minuscule, even if it's a little bit, yeah, you can't be a little pregnant. Fair enough. So the Lukaku goal gets... But, but, but that it was used constantly, stay the hell on side. Okay, especially in that game where you're seeing it's just happening constantly. And, and I know that forwards love to play on that edge. I, 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 I get it, but I, I, wasn't, I wasn't as bent right, out of shape as a lot of people it. were. Uh, so it ended nil-nil. Uh, we go to penalties, and I, I, I buried the lead here. Now, to be fair to Tuchel, uh, he has done this before. Right. At the start of the season in the UEFA Super Cup against Villarreal, he brought on Kepa in the 119th minute. Kepa made two saves in the shootout. They won. Also, they had won two shootouts in the League Cup this season en route to this final against Aston Villa in the third round, Southampton in the fourth round. Kepa made some big saves in both those shootouts. He is a very good penalty kick stopper. Um, but in the moment, that just felt ridiculous to me. You've got the best goalkeeper in the world who is having an absolute blinder. And I think all everybody I was watching the game with looked at that and said, boy, he might be overthinking this one. And and but still you think, okay, we'll see what happens. Who knows? And it ends up being like the worst case scenario for him. It's almost like taking, as you mentioned last week, a Paneka penalty, where if it works, you look like a genius. If right. not, you look like a fool. This was sort of the equivalent of that for Tuchel. Sure enough, everybody else makes it comes down to the keepers taking it, keepers taking it, and Kepa skies his. It hasn't even landed yet. So um, what did you make of that whole situation? <laughs> To, to your point, because there is some precedent, uh, uh, then Tuchel, I think, is he's justified. But even before, it just it kind of just rubbed me the wrong way. I I don't know what goalkeeper would would want that to happen. I mean, the goalkeepers that I know, they want they want to finish the job. They want they want it on them. And, ult and ultimately, when you do something like that, I mean, it's an incredible ballsy, big roll of the dice there, e even if it has worked in the past. And maybe especially that it has worked in the past, because at some point that well is going to run, run dry. He ultimately didn't save a single one of them. Neither, <laughs> neither goalkeeper uh, did. At, I mean, the, the, by the way, the penalties were, for the most part, there were a couple of them that were iffy, but for the most part, they were pretty phenomenal in the, uh, in the placement uh, of them. And bang, back and forth, back and forth, 10. And then it goes to the, uh, the goalkeepers. And of course you knew it. The soccer gods up there giggling amongst themselves saying, this is exactly what we are, uh, what we are going to do. I, I, I don't think that there's too much, or there should be too much blame or consternation out there when it comes to the way that Tuchel is viewed in this. It just, 
it, it, there's something weird about it. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, can you have, I guess you can have a specialist in saving penalties, but when they get in there, they should prove their specialty. I don't know what it is with Kepa and League Cup finals, because you might recall it was in 2019, that whole episode against Manchester City in which he, Maritza Sadi tried to sub him out and he yeah. refused to come off. And so there's something about it. <laughs> he really likes Caribou, right? Caribou <laughs> somehow like... makes himself the story each time uh, Chelsea play a League Cup final. It was a great game, though, to your point. It was a, for a 0-0 game, the back and forth and obviously the, the, the drama. And it just made me giggle at the, at the end of it. Uh, this game was played against the backdrop of the Roman Abramovich situation. We don't talk about politics much on this podcast, but it's sort of unavoidable here. Sure. Um, so Abramovich has been Chelsea's owner since 2003. He is a billionaire Russian oligarch who has some ties to Vladimir Putin. How close those ties are is a matter of debate. But in light of recent events, there's been this huge outcry in the UK, politicians saying that he should be stripped of ownership of the team. And so he comes out on the eve of this match and puts out a kind of a fuzzy statement that people were trying to make sense out of, uh, essentially saying he's not going to sell the team. He's still the owner, but he's going to take a step back, not be involved at all. He's going to hand over quote unquote stewardship of the team to the trustees on this, on Chelsea's charity foundation. Um, and so some people feel like that's, that's not enough and, and he, sh he should no longer be the owner. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything, any thoughts? On I mean, that? look, you know, we, you know, we we are doing this podcast uh, on Monday, as I mentioned, uh, while the world turns and churns, and you know the um, you know this this horror that has been visited upon the people of uh, of Ukraine, and you know I think we all want it to come to an end as quickly and as safely as possible. What that ultimately looks like, uh, uh, who knows? But you know the the intersection and the connection of politics, obviously money and the sport that we love are vast and inevitable when it comes uh, to uh, things like this. And, and I don't know, I don't know what the right answer is or what uh, ultimately uh, should be done. We're also, as we come on air, uh, it should be mentioned that uh, FIFA has announced that Russia will not be participating and not be allowed to participate in World Cup qualifying uh, come up. So they have been, for all intents and purposes, basically kicked out of the World Cup process here. And it was coming down to the wire for them. Uh, and this comes on the heels of a no number of teams that they were going to face saying that they, they wouldn't play uh, against them. So you know, when it comes to Russia uh, with their actions, if they... Whether they planned or not, they are they are pariahs, and rightfully so in, in many instances. Yeah, to hop back to Chelsea for a second, Oliver Holt, this English journalist, wrote a very good piece about how the Premier League uh, getting in bed with unsavory characters and, and, and you know, sort of the chickens are coming home to roost there uh, and pointing out also Newcastle and Saudi Arabia and why that's problematic and, and Manchester City. You have Manchester City draping themselves in the Ukrainian flag and they have a Ukrainian player in Zinchenko and Pep Guardiola speaking very eloquently in support of Ukraine. At the same time, the UAE abstained in a United Nations vote condoning Russia's invasion. So Oliver Holt pointing out why then that there's a bit of a contradiction there that needs to be grappled with. So yeah. I mean, the, you know, the the hypocrisy uh, is, uh, again, expected, not surprising and rampant when it comes to a lot of these things. But ultimately, if if any of this stuff does change the course then i guess in that sense uh, it's a yeah. good thing and just to whip through the soccer world's reaction so far and then we'll move on so the uefa champions league final was going to be in st petersburg that's been moved to paris mm -hmm. um spartak moscow which was the only russian team left in european competition uh they've been booted out of the europa league they were set to face leipzig in the round of 16 so leipzig just gets a buy into the quarterfinals and then yeah as you mentioned uh breaking news today uh, Russia will not be allowed to compete in World Cup qualifying. They were going to be involved in the March playoffs. They were set to host Poland. And then if they won that, they would have been hosting either Sweden or Czech Republic. As you mentioned, all three of those countries came out and said they refused to play Russia. And so FIFA really didn't have a choice in the matter. They've come out and said Russia will not be involved in that. So they are effectively out of the World and Cup. These, and, and, you know, these talks and these discussions about, you know, the, uh, the hypocrisy and the whataboutisms that are, are absolutely legitimate and fair to have when it comes to what we are talking about will continue as we, uh, as we go forward to this. So uh, you want to move on here? Yeah. To end the England conversation on a positive note, yes. uh, I know it's a transition. It's a 
odd transition back to the field, but at least we have like a feel good story to talk about. Christian Eriksen yep. uh, came on for Brentford in the second half of their game against Newcastle, his first appearance since the Euros when he had that heart problem. So great to see him back on the field. It, it's great, and yet you, I mean, you 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 hold your breath, because, knowing the history and obviously the you know the incredible scenes that we saw. I, I'm glad that he is being given the opportunity to continue to do what he does so well and what has been his life for a number of years. And, and I don't think that he would have been allowed to do this if they, <laughs> if they didn't understand and vet and uh, the, uh, you know, the risks involved. And so it's great. I'm, I'm glad that he's out there and I hope he is able to do it for many years to come. Uh, Manchester United nil nil against Watford, and this was on the heels of a one one draw against Atletico Madrid in Spain, which is not a bad result. But very fortunate they were they were horrific in that game as well. I'm not going to feel too bad for Atletico Madrid because they've been on the other side of this coin many times uh, under Simeone, in which uh, they were completely outplayed and somehow snatched the result. And the other team walked off the field scratching their heads, wondering how on earth they didn't win the game. But that was Atletico in this instance because they were clearly the better team. United were awful and somehow come away with a pretty good result. Snatch and grab from Manchester United? <laughs> boy, oh boy, yeah. that's, what, that's what we're left with when it comes to Manchester United. Okay. Uh, then Atletico, to transition to La Liga, Atletico followed up that result by beating Celta Vigo 2-0. Uh, Real Madrid and Sevilla both won. Sevilla beat Betis in the derby, so the gap is still six at the top between those two teams. But the big story in Spain, I'm going to say it, Barcelona are back. They're back, baby. Does it coincide with uh, Serginho Dest? Uh to some degree, yeah. Uh, no, yeah. absolutely. Um, uh, so 4 0 win over Athletic Bilbao. Third straight game in which they scored four goals. They had also done it against Valencia and Napoli, and not too long ago against Atletico Madrid. Um, Pierre Emerick Abamayan got one. He's been a very nice addition. Usman Dembele, a goal and two assists, and, and some cheers from the crowd. So he seems to have been rehabilitated there. Uh, Pedri with a master class. He's being hailed as a new Iniesta. And as you mentioned, Serginho Dest, who I thought was being treated very unfairly there, had fallen out of favor, was potentially even on his way out, and I didn't quite understand why, and he seems to have won over Xavi. He started this game at left back and played well, while Danny Alves played very well at right back. So great performances from the fullbacks. Yeah, good to see Sergino Des. He is back on track there. Everybody praising him. Yeah, I mean, this is... I mean, we, we've known that he is probably the best right and left back for the U.S. men's national team. And so that he's getting some reps at left back is is good going forward. I mean, I don't see him necessarily playing there going forward unless there, you know, there are some injuries. But it's not very deep when it comes to our left back position. But I, I'm happy for him that he has kind of worked through this. I'm happy that he is, at least for now, won over his uh, his new manager and that he recognizes the talent that he is and how he can help win games uh, by being on the field. Incidentally, they're a point out of third, uh, one point behind Real Betis. It's certainly trending towards them, surpassing Betis and finishing third, which is where they finished in La Liga last season with Messi. So make make of that what you Messi would. sucks? Is that what you said? <laughs> you don't need Messi? We, um, we laugh at Messi. Uh, next up, Italy, where... Um, at the top, uh, both AC Milan and Inter Milan dropped points. Uh, AC Milan won one draw with Udinese. Inter Milan held to a nil-nil draw by Genoa. You know, not, not long ago, I thought Inter was clearly the best team there when pull away, but they've really had a dip here, and I, I'm not so sure anymore. Napoli able to capitalize. They beat Lazio 2-1. Uh, Lorenzo Insigne among the goal scorers there. He's continuing to play well yep. out of his MLS move. Uh, so it's now... AC Milan and Napoli both at 57 and Inter who have played one fewer game at 55. So that is the best title race in Europe for sure. And lurking not that far away is Juventus in fourth place with 50 points. The incredible Dusan Vlahovic found the back of the net twice in their 3-2 win over Empoli. Uh, this was after scoring one minute into his European debut, their Champions League game away to Villarreal where they got a 1-1 draw. However, the very disappointing note in that game uh, Wesson McKinney, who's been in lights out form and was playing very well in this game, uh, came off injured, a fracture. He looks like he's going to be out, was it 8 to 12 weeks, yeah. Jason? Yeah, it's uh, it's sad. It's very sad for him. Um, I think right now when we look at Weston McKinney, what we should basically hope for is that he gets rest in the summer. He starts off well in the fall with Juventus and is ready for the uh, the World Cup. Uh, he, as you mentioned, not only was playing well, but even in that game, I thought he was the best player on the field. And, he, you know, he suffers a fracture of, I think it's the third and fourth metatarsal. I actually, I broke my fifth metatarsal, which is actually a, a pretty common thing for 
soccer players uh, to do. And I ended up having a screw put in and bone taken from my ankle and put in. I don't know what they plan to do. Uh, you can certainly let it heal on its own, uh, which is one way to go. I haven't read anything about if he's getting surgery, if he's not getting surgery, but ultimately, you know, you're looking in terms of months uh, that he's going to be off. So yeah, sucks for him. I'm sad uh, for him, but he's, he still has a long career ahead of him. This, this too will heal. And from a U.S. men's national team perspective, next man up. You got to get it done in this next window without uh, the likes of Weston McKinney. Uh, I'm going to go Germany next because it segues more naturally off that. Um, Dortmund held to a 1-1 draw away to Augsburg. Ricardo Pepe started this game uh, ineffective, came off early in the second half. Uh, Gio Reyna did not play, but he, he's been giving interviews saying he's very confident he'll be ready for the uh, qualifiers in March. Uh, so what do you think? Uh, with McKinney out, uh, more of a spotlight on, on Reyna? And, I mean, I know they don't play the same position. Yeah, but yeah, uh, you know, again, this, this fascination with Gio Reyna, I think is justified. I think it's fair, as we've said. But you know, he will have had basically the past year of stops and starts and major injuries and major time out. He hasn't really played a part in most of the qualifying when it comes to the U.S. men's national team. That's, I mean, I, and I'm not saying you don't you you don't bring him in because of the quality that he is, but automatically assuming that Gio Reyna in camp for the U.S. men's national team is going to be a starting position or even an impactful type of presence, you know, not so fast. I hope I hope it happens. Uh, I hope that he is fit. I hope he feels good. I hope he feels mo- motivated, um, but. You know, we, we, we haven't had a lot of time with him. And, there's, and, and if this is truly a group of all this talent and depth, then this is the time for that group to step up. Uh, Byron, by the way, I still say not, as all, not all is right in Byron's world, okay. but they did eke out a 1-0 win we over always Frankfurt, say this about this which time. coupled with Dortmund's result, the gap is back up to eight. Um, and then also not wait, much... Wait, the gap is eight and all is not right? <laughs> um. Uh, also, not too much to say about Ligue 1, PSG running away with it. They beat Saint-Étienne 3-1. to one. Uh, Messi with uh, Mbappe with two goals, both assisted by Messi, who played very well. And then Mbappe also assisted the other goal by Danilo. Uh, the interesting note here is Mbappe up to 156 goals for PSG. That ties Laton for second most all time. The record is held by Edinson Cavani with 200, so he's 44 away. He was asked afterwards, hey... You're going to stick around and try to break that record. And he gave kind of a cheeky smile, said, yeah, we'll see. So, you know, everybody's trying to interpret Mbappe now, everything he says, and try to get a read on his future, which I still think is gone. Round. <laughs> I mean, he's gone. I, I, with all due respect, becoming PSG's all-time leading scorer, is, I don't think is enough of like a carrot for him to... How dare you, Mon ami? You, the, the <laughs> Francophile that you are, and this is... Oh, God. Uh, and, and last thing, uh, the only Champions League game I didn't mention, but just to put a ribbon on the round of 16 first legs, Benfica Ajax finished 2-2. Ajax, uh, immensely entertaining team, but they, they might be kicking themselves over this result. They should have won. Even when they were up 2-1, they kept attacking, which is nice to see, but a little sloppy at the back. They surrender an equalizer. Remember, the, the, there's no away goals rule, so the fact that they scored twice, they, might have, it could have been 0-0, would have been just the same. So we now go back to Amsterdam for a winner-take-all second leg against Benfica. Um, so we'll see. Uh, Did you just say that 0-0 would have been the same as 2-0? Well, yeah. I mean, in effect, the, I mean, there's no away goals in the Champions League anymore. So I actually can't even look at that result and say, hey, it's 2-2, but we got two away goals. So, we're, you know, it's it's a draw. Wait, wait. What was the score of the first game? This is the first leg. Right. So what was the score? 2-2. 2-2. Two, two. Two, two. Oh, okay. I thought you said 2 nothing. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. I thought you said... <laughs> Okay, sorry. I'm sorry. It's my old brain working. Sorry. Uh, that is it. I'm sorry for even doubting you there. I apologize. That is the situation in Europe. We finished that in record time. I mean, all right. Uh, we'll take another quick break. When we come back, it's time for Ask Alexi. Don't go anywhere. All right, we're back. Time for Ask Alexi. Use that hashtag Ask Alexi uh, and you send it out on all the uh, social media platforms out there. Or you call that, that, that hotline. Uh, that hotline was buzzing this week. 657 549 2297, the State of the Union podcast hotline at 657-549-2297. You can leave us, leave us a message. Hopefully it's something interesting and, uh, you know, it, uh, and entertaining and you do it in an efficient manner, which uh, we have done today. All right. I think we got one Twitter, uh, Twitter question and then we got a couple of audio questions, right? Yeah. First up, the Twitter question um, at writer01. He asked you, how is Mossy handling the sacking of Bielsa? Well, we, so we come uh, to find out that the great 
Marcelo Bielsa uh, has been sacked, fired, canned, uh, let loose. What are the other ones? Whatever. I mean, he is no longer the coach of Leeds. I, I don't know. I'll, I'm asking you. What? Uh, how do you feel? This was to you, ultimately. Through me. I'm the conduit. I am a Bielsa groupie, as anybody that listens to this podcast knows. He is in the short list of my favorite human beings. Mm -hmm. Uh, but even I recognize that the magic was gone. This was trending towards them getting relegated, so they did need to make a change. So I have no issue with Bielsa being gone. Uh, and then the second part of the story is all the reports are that Jesse Marsh uh, will be his replacement, which, um, look, he's an American, so that's exciting. It's it's a neat opportunity. Uh, but there are some questions. Is it a neat opportunity? I was going to say, there are, there, there are some questions here about the timing of this. And so I'm hoping we can get beyond this notion that anybody that questions this is being an anti-American snob. I know we just had the Chris Armas, Ted Lasso situation. So American soccer fans are particularly sensitive about that. But I think that you can you can take a step back from this and say, you know, we, we, we're used to seeing with these Premier League teams, you cross a point in the season where you think, well, there's not enough time left to do anything really overly ambitious. You just got to get a guy in there who's used to grinding out points yeah. in the Premier League and keeping us up. And Leeds, I kind of thought would go that route. Instead, they bring in Jesse Marsh and they have only 12 games left in the season. He's being thrown into a relegation battle. It's and Sacrificial it, American it, lamb. A little little cute little American sacrificial I, lamb. I've seen tweets from English journalists saying the next three months are going to define Jesse Marsh's managerial career, which to me is very unfair to him. And so that's where you worry about the situation. It's going to be fine. Don't you worry about it. Let's go. <laughs> hold on. Let's start with the Bielsa part of it. OK, right. when, when I think about Bielsa, we know that this is a a man who is fascinating uh, and popular relative to his eccentricities, both as a human, you know, whether it's sitting on a bucket or uh, you know his, his translation or lack of translation and all the things that he says, and because of his eccentricities in the way that he has his teams play. And in doing so, he, you know, he provides this... <clears throat> this romantic ideal. And I think a lot of coaches from the outside, they look at him with understandable fondness uh, because they would love to be able to do some of the things that he does. Now, for me, Bielsa is no more or less interesting than a Jurgen Klopp or a Pep Guardiola. But when, when even Pep or Jurgen Klopp look at him, while they may look at him and say, ah, oh, that's really interesting and romantic in the way that he goes about things, and maybe I'd love to be able to do some of the things, they'd never dare do that. So where does, where does the eccentric, romantic notion of this coach stop? And ultimately, you hold him accountable for the results that you, that you get. I, I, why does he, why does he, and, and I, I, I have an answer, but I'm interested in your answer. Why does he get this kind of preferential treatment? You know what he is? He's the Larry Miller of uh, managers. Larry Miller, this comedian who uh, is what they, they call a comedian's comedian, that the other comedians all worship him and respect him and, and, and put him on their shows. Mm -hmm. uh, he appeared on Seinfeld as the doorman in an episode. Bill Maher has him on his show all the time. And yet he's never actually done anything really <laughs> on his own of any great distinction. And yet all the other comedians in the fraternity seem to worship him. Is he a good coach, Moss? Uh, Manager, coach, whatever you want to call him. Yes, uh, I think he's been incredibly influential and revolutionary. And I think the overall body of work, he's had a very positive influence on uh, the, the sport. And even, you know, just narrowing in on Leeds United, I, I think... If you ask any Leeds United fan, they look at his four-year tenure there as overall a positive. He got them back in the Premier League um, for the first time in 15 years, and 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 just how entertaining the team was to watch. But you know, he, but why can't he keep doing it? He's eccentric. There is a shelf life there. Um, why is there a shelf life? Why does it? Why can't he just keep? If I mean, if he's so good, why can't he keep having this team play well? I know I'm being a little flip, but 
Does it just get old? Is it do the does the the opposition figure it out eventually? Does he just not have the tools? Yeah, to I be think able to do it? I think the opposition figuring it out to some degree. It's funny. The book on him is that even over the course of a, a single season, his style is so physically demanding that his teams would tend to wear down. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe there's something at play there in a longer sense. Mm-hmm. Three or four years of that style, you know, can can also wear a team down. So. All right, uh, let's uh, let's get uh, but, finish this off yeah, about uh, Jesse. Jesse, Marsh, right? uh, Jesse. So, again, in the same way that when when Bob took uh, Swansea, you can't afford to say no. That's the problem. This is the the Premier League. This is the the biggest of the leagues out there, and so I think it would take, you know, a, a big set uh, for Jesse, you know, who's out of a job right now. To turn to turn this down, but to your point, he's going to be placed in a very very difficult situation with a team that is already struggling, with a team that, to your point about Bielsa, has done things in a certain way for a number of years, and for the most part, it's been uh, been successful. And he's going to have to come in and very very quickly either throw that completely out the window or tweak it here or there to get better results and better performances out of it. And if he if he does it, if he does it, great. He's a king and he, uh, and he kicks on. If he doesn't, it's not only is he a bad coach, but he's a bad coach in many people's eyes, and I know we are sensitive to this, uh, being an American coach. And his, his task, like everywhere he's been or any American player's been, is to get people to stop thinking about him as an American first and ultimately just think about him as a good coach who happens to be American as opposed to an American coach. And, you know, he'll come in, and then, you know, there, you know, there's the the snark out there about, oh, you know, he's going to call it soccer and the, uh, you know, all the caricatures and the ridicule that, that American Americans in soccer get is all part of it. We accept that. Jesse understands that. He's a big boy. He understands it. I, I kind of want him to to do it and throw it back in people's faces and say, screw you. This is uh, this is who I am. And I'm going to call it this and I'm going to do this and ultimately I believe in what I'm doing and, uh, you know, it saved them, basically. I think the two that got Bob Bradley in trouble were uh, PKs mm. and road games. You know, they say away games there. So do you realize how, <laughs> like, provincial and disrespectful and, like, stupid that is? Oh, God. Drives me nuts. But, but me saying that it's stupid doesn't change the fact that it exists. And so you have to be aware if you are someone like Jesse or anybody else going into this situation that the things that you do, the things that you say, hell, the things that you wear, all of it is going to be subject to ridicule and subject to being used uh, to further people's stereotypes or preconceived notions of who you are, especially in this case, relative to the nation that you come from. All right, next up is an audio question courtesy of Gary from Louisville. Hey, Alexi and Mossy. Uh, this is Gary in Louisville, home of your 2022 U.S. Open Cup champions, Louisville City FC. The reason I'm reaching out is I want to rehash an old topic around an older player. As you guys have stated numerous times, the most important thing in our game is scoring goals. And since it seems that the United States men's national team has a penchant for uh, being a second-half team and kind of leaving things late at times, uh, I feel like we need someone who could come on and add something a little different. How would you feel about a healthy, revitalized Josie Altidore being a super sub a la an Olivier Giroud type uh, for the red, white, and blue? Thanks for all you guys do, and uh, look forward to many more podcasts. All right. Thank you, Gary, from uh, Louisville. So you remember a few years ago, uh, and if you don't, I will refresh your, your memory. There was a question as to who our, who our striker was from the national team perspective. And at that point, even though Josie had you know, not kind of kicked on and continued on, I said it, it was Josie Altidore. And I was ridiculed. People ridiculed me, uh, Mossy. I, and, and so... That this is coming back around. Well, first off, I think everybody agrees. It just shows the dearth of, of talent and quality and options that we have up top. And for all of the progress and evolution that has been made 
and the talent that we have developed, we have yet to find somebody that has come in to replace Josie Altidore, so much so that Gary here is willing to ask this question. And we did this uh, on our uh, broadcast, our Fox broadcast this weekend, and one of the uh, offside or onsides uh, that was posed to our good friend Marisa Du was, will Josie be on the plane if and when the uh, U.S. men's national team qualifies for Qatar? And, and Mo said yes. I don't think it is as crazy as people believe. We saw Josie get on the field this weekend for uh, New England. If Josie is healthy, and that is playing game in and game out, not necessarily starting, but playing game in and game out, yeah, of course you consider it. I, I ultimately don't think that that is something that is going to happen. Both, um, Even if he's scoring goals and playing, I still don't think that 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 Greg Berhalter is going to go back to that, um, back to that basket. But man, oh man, if he's scoring, I mean, this is a guy who's we we because he came into the league when he was a teenager. We we think that he's so much older than he actually is, and he's still in his early thirties. All of that knowledge and that experience uh, that he has, and if he is playing and scoring, yeah, I think that there is a temptation to do it. But I also think that. You know, if it, if it didn't happen for Michael Bradley and some of these other players, this is really a team that is built on youth and a movement forward. It, and that, that has positives and that has, has negatives. But ultimately, I think in, in totality, it's, it's a, a positive. And I think even if he's scoring, I still think that, uh, that that's not going to happen. What are you? You know, there is some chatter about FIFA increasing the squad size from 23 to 26 players. At the World Cup, be interesting to see if they do that. How many strikers you take? Does that give you some leeway to take one or two kind of wild card Josie types? And hey, if 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 he gets hurt, who cares? It's not that big a deal, you know. But there's some upside there if he's healthy, and uh, so that's kind of. I just worry about dynamic. You know, this team has been through a lot over the last couple of years, and they have kind of created this this dynamic. And you plop Josie back in, and I know he's been there. And I'm not saying that Josie would be a cancer or, or a problem. It's just you start messing with some of those relationships and the, you know, the, the dynamics and that manifests in so many different ways. And because you're, you're, you know, you're living together, you're, you're eating together, you're training together, you're doing all that kind of stuff. I just, I think you got to be really careful about doing something like that. It, it is amazing how unsettled that position still is. We, yep. were, we were talking this weekend about how many different players at some point in the last couple of years, you tried to talk yourself into, even including guys like Nicholas Joachini, who yeah, remember him. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. All right. Good question there, uh, Gary. Um, and then we'll end with another audio question. This one, courtesy of Keating from Indiana. Hey, Alexi. Hey, Monty. This is Keating from Evansville, Indiana. Um, with the start of the new MLS season, I was calling to get your thoughts on the uniforms this year. Um, first off, Alexi, what was your favorite uniform you ever wore, whether it was a national team one or an MLS one? And um, of this season, who do you think has the best and the worst uniforms? Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, so the the whole... Uh, I call them uniforms. I call them jerseys. I know people call them kits and stuff like that. I hope you, for, no, I don't want you to forgive me. I don't care if you <laughs> forgive me or not. I'm going to call it a uniform uh, or a jersey. The, the, whole, the whole phenomenon of, uh, of you know, the unveiling, uh, and there's been a lot of them this, this year. It, it, to you, it's a soccer jersey to be used on the road when taking PKs. Exactly. <laughs> there it is. Perfect. Um, okay, so when it comes to the the best. I am so happy uh, that my friends down there in Miami, at Inter Miami, have finally decided to lean in um, in a way that they haven't in the past to pink. This was a team that came online and pink was one of their colors, which made them already unique and distinct relative to all the other teams out there. And it's not easy because the, the color palette out there there's not a lot of real estate out there uh, when it comes to, to, to colors. So they said that pink was going to be part of it. I said, great, own pink. If you're going to do pink, don't go half pink. Don't go uh, red pen in uh, the washing machine with, with whites, which is what they kind of were. You go full pink. And I think that they have gone much fuller pink right now because when I, when I walk into a bar, when I walk, through a, a hotel lobby, when I go through an airport, 
When I look at a television screen, I want to immediately identify and recognize who that team is. That to me is an important part of creating credibility and, and relevancy. And too often I'm confused, but they are pink right now. It's, it's not anything ridiculously crazy. Um, not that, it, that something ridiculously crazy can't still be good, but it's just pink. I know what inter, when Inter Miami is playing because they are pink. Like I said, whether I'm seeing it on the television screen, whether I'm sitting in a bar and I see somebody walk in, that's, that's one of us. So for, I'm, I'm going to give you my best one, and that's the, the Inter Miami, the pink one. Um, you wanna, do you have your best one? Or? Well, I just want to say, uh, for opening weekend of MLS, you guys received a bunch of jerseys from the league, and Rob Stone was very generous and gave uh, one of the ones he received to me as a gift, and it is a New England Revolution jersey. Uh, so for those watching on YouTube, I'm going to hold this up. I'm going to be wearing this uh, with pride this season. You're, you're reigning Supporter Shield winners. Um, so I, I quite like this jersey. What do you think of this one? they got the new logo in there. Well, it's funny that you should bring that up because we're about to do um, what we think our worst jerseys are. Okay? Okay. Um, the First off, when you are a specific color and you have spent years cultivating that color to identify yourself, if you go completely away from it, I think that that's problematic. I don't like that. So for example, up there in Portland, look, I love Portland. Uh, I love a lot of the things that they do. They're, I know that it's the Rose City. I get it. But you're green. You've always been green. You pride yourself on being green. I look at and I see that's Portland, that's green. And now you're this rose thing that looks kind of like a cartoon that's out of focus. You can't even see the actual uh, roses. I mean, if you're going to go roses, I want to be able to make out the roses. So I'm not happy with with uh, with that one. And Merritt, Merritt, if you're listening, you can scream and yell at me. You don't care what I say. Uh, but that's the one that I have a problem with. However, it's better than this one when it comes to the New England Revolution. Really? I think that this is the most boring uniform I've seen. Then there's some other ones that are boring, especially since this is this is your new logo, which I actually like. I like the new logo. I think they did a really good job in designing this. But it's you took a a really interesting um and I think creative and impactful new logo and you and you gave it a you know it's like taking a picture and giving it a crap frame. So yeah, I mean I don't I, I listen. I love the New England Revolution, and they have men and women up there that worked very, very hard on all of this. But I just think that they have put this wonderful new logo on something that is very uninspiring. The only thing I'll say: this is a large. I'm not sure Josie, from what I saw this weekend, could fit into this. Oh, they might need, they might need an extra large. Oh my goodness! How dare you? How <laughs> dare you, David Mossy? Um, look, this is it's all subjective. All right, we're just having uh, fun here, and. It's not an exact science. Uh, these people, as I said, they're men and women across the league, both that work for the league and people that work for Adidas, the official sponsor out there that work long and hard on these things. And you're never going to satisfy everybody. But listen, if you are going to have, have these unveilings, it's designed to get attention. And when that attention comes, people are going to have opinions. Yes, I like this. No, I don't like this. This is great. This is, this is better. This is worse. All that kind of stuff. So don't complain to me when you ask me my opinion after the unveiling of these new works of art. And I like some and uh, I don't like other ones. So congratulations, Inter-Miami. Not so much uh, New England Revolution. <laughs> Anything else, Monsi? That is it. All right, we're going to take another quick break uh, and finish up the show here, uh, here with my one for the road. All right, we're back. Uh, we've done a pretty good job of keeping it under time, right? I think we're going to come right in about the time that we normally do. We tried to get it a little uh, shorter, but, uh, you know, uh, didn't quite work out that way. Um, okay, uh, it is the end of the show, and I, at, the each, uh, at the end of each and uh, every show, I give you my one for the road. We are here this week, and last week, some big news broke about the U.S. Uh, women's national team. It's a story that's been going on for years and years with regards to the litigation, um, and like I said, year after year, of it dragging for uh, dragging on and uh, the appeals going on and on. We come to find out that the United States Soccer Federation and the U.S. Women's National Team, and when I say team, it's a collection of about 66 players uh, that have been involved in this litigation for many years right now, have come to an agreement uh, and a settlement. And it's in the form of money. 
this was um, a lot of it was about money. And ultimately, this got solved with money. So the settlement is as follows. $22 million is going to the players, as I mentioned, those 66 players. Another $2 million, so a total of $24 million, another $2 million uh, is being put in an account uh, for these 66 players to access post-career and things that they are doing with their work or charity work, uh, and they can apply for up to $50,000. Uh, this is about a third, ultimately, of what they had sought from uh, from their uh, uh, from their filings and their uh, and their litigation, um, it's still plenty of money. That this is over, and when I say over, it's with this caveat: this is contingent on the signing of the collective bargaining agreement for the women's team, and that's that's a whole nother um, can of worms. Except, I don't think that they would have come out publicly with this had they not believed that it was further, far enough down the road that this was going to get solved uh, in terms of the CBA. And I hope that it does. There, there's three, three parts of this. The settlement that we just talked about, the money. There's the women's CBA, that, which needs to get solved. There's the men's CBA and the connection between the two going forward. And then there's the equal prize money. All of that has to get solved going forward, but this is a step in the right direction. From a, from a U.S. Soccer Federation I think this is ultimately a no-brainer. The U.S. women's national team, I think, was very, very smart in leveraging the court of public opinion and having incredible amount of um, power uh, and support on their side for what uh, they were ultimately uh, were doing. But from a U.S. Soccer Federation, spending lots of money, being looked at and, and, and vilified and looked at as the bad people in this uh, scenario, whether right or wrong, perception or reality doesn't, doesn't matter. That's the way that it was... Uh, that it was being framed. And from a practical perspective, this was hurting the United States Soccer Federation in terms of, of, of uh, getting sponsorship. So this settlement brings the parties together. It creates a situation that, while not harmonious, but is a whole lot more cordial and a whole lot more beneficial to everybody involved, including the Federation in terms of the business that they do, and by the way, the women and men that will share in the business that they do in terms of revenue sharing uh, going forward. Um, so I think that this is in what was a, at times a difficult um, and jarring and damaging type of situation to individuals and entities. Uh, this is as, as good as you could possibly have this thing turn out. And I'm glad that this has ended in a way that both parties feel like they can move forward because this has taken a lot of energy, a lot of resources, and a lot of commitment and fight from both sides, let's be honest. And it's taken a lot of attention away. And the time's good attention and shown a spotlight on the inequities and some of the problems that the United States Soccer Federation has, that the United States soccer has in general. This isn't fixing all of those things, but it's putting us in a forward type of trajectory and motion so that we can, yes, have more equity and more equality when it comes to the money uh, and the treatment that exists between uh, men's soccer and women's soccer, but also move forward to building the game of soccer in the United States. It requires everybody. That requires everybody working hand in hand. That requires everybody collaborating and cooperating. And when you're in court and you're suing people and lawyers are constantly involved, it's very, very difficult to get things to done. done. So I do think that this, to a certain extent, requires a congratulations and a hope that we move forward um, and we can get back to the you know, the work and the difficulties and the challenges both on the field in terms of developing, but also one of the wonderful things that we have and off the field that require not just personnel, but also require uh, funding uh, and require attention. And it won't be the last time that there are, there are problems and disagreements going forward, but this is, looks to be, and once again, it's contingent, but it looks to be at least the start of something new and something much more positive because this was dragging on and in doing so dragging a lot of things down. And so I'm glad that this has been uh, settled and I hope that we can go forward and learn 
from some of the mistakes that were made and learn from some of the things that were brought to light by you know, the women uh, and learn through the entire process uh, so that we don't have this next generation that we've already talked about on this pod uh, that comes to play and represent what I feel is the greatest country in the world having to deal with thing, these things uh, going forward. This story's not over. Uh, as I said, there's still plenty of, uh, to happen, but uh, I wanted to at least address that and because uh, um, I think it's a, it's a big story. And I think as we get further away from it, it might be looked at as an even bigger story uh, and a real important and seminal type of moment in the development and the evolution of soccer, not necessarily on the field, uh, but off the field, which at times is as important and maybe in certain cases more important than uh, than what happens on the field. Anything, Mossy, before we leave? Uh, how's the food in Charlotte? What can I look forward to? I to- I- I've been to Charlotte. I know I've been to Charlotte. I just cannot remember anything of it. We are, okay, like you said, we're excited. We're going to experience it for the first time. And I'm always interested to see how it looks. Uh, and they're excited. They're jacked up, as they should be. 75,000 people. Now, keep in mind, this is a Charlotte team that doesn't have a second bite at the apple. This is their stadium. This is where they're playing. They cannot have a soft launch. They have to get this right. And this tent that we always talk about, it's pretty big right now. And they're going to invite a lot of people that maybe don't know anything about soccer into that tent. And you're only going to get one chance uh, to make that good first impression. And that doesn't even necessarily mean that you have to, to win. Win would be great. Lots of goals would be great. But you got to show them that this was fun. This was something that I want to come back to. Because if you're Cincinnati and you, you don't have that hard launch in the form of a stadium coming a few years later, it could get very ugly. Not since Alonzo Mourning and Larry Johnson were patrolling the paint has Charlotte sports been this interesting. So I'm, I'm looking forward to being down there. I don't know. Is there, does Charlotte have a specific dish? I don't, I don't think they do. But we're going to find out. We're going to figure it out. All right, listen, uh, we will be back again, same time, same place next week. Do check out that Carly Lloyd interview because it's always interesting to hear what Carly has to say about all things that are going on, uh, including the, 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 um, the, the recent settlement that we, just, uh, that we just talked about. That'll be out later on this, uh, this week. We'll be back here, same time, same place next week for more of the State of the Union. Thank you for reviewing and downloading and subscribing and doing all the different things that you uh, that you do out there don't forget to send us those questions whether it's on twitter or facebook or instagram uh, use that hashtag ask alexi and then of course our state of the union podcast hotline at 657-549-2297 657-549-2297 and as we mentioned coming march which will be our next uh broadcast we will start putting people into the drawing for some special swag have we figured that out? It is special, right? We can't just give it away to anybody? Okay. It is special. So uh, the uh, the audio questions that we get starting next week, you will be put into it. I'm sorry, Gary. I'm sorry, Keating. You just didn't quite make it into March, but I still appreciate you sending your questions this week. And you can continue to send questions going forward. Again, 657-549-2297. We'll talk again next week. Until then, and as always, size the day. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. 